But one of the most well-known victims of the tower was either completely innocent of any cunning or ambition, or extremely naive. Jane Grey was just 15 years old when her life was turned upside down. She landed in a nightmare where everyone, even her parents, abandoned her. Trapped in a paranoid web of intrigue, Jane's nightmare was real enough, though. Her horrible journey included a nine-day reign as Queen of England, the shortest ever, and it included an unwanted stay in the tower. Jane's cousin was 15-year-old King Edward VI. When he took the throne in 1547, he was weak and sickly. Six years later, the child king was near death. Because of the king's youth and illness, a group of nobles known as the Royal Council ran the kingdom. The council was run by the ambitious Duke of Northumberland. Northumberland's power was threatened because if the king should die before he could cement his position, the throne would revert to the king's elder sister, Mary. He hatched a risky plot. He would arrange a marriage between his own teenage son, Lord Guildford, and the king's cousin, Jane Grey, who was a Protestant and would keep the faith. Then. Northumberland would persuade the dying king to name Jane as his heir. Northumberland would then effectively rule the country. Jane and the young Guildford knew nothing of their parents' scheme. The two teenagers who barely knew each other were told they were to become husband and wife. Jane's greedy social climbing parents jumped at the chance and eagerly agreed to the plot. The marriage was arranged. On the morning of her wedding, guests remarked she looked like a toy doll, even younger than her years. But the omens for Jane's marriage were not good. Thunder and torrential rain marred the hastily arranged wedding. After the ceremony, the couple suddenly found themselves alone not in a world of their making at all. Jane was determined to do her duty and fulfill her role as a right and proper wife to Guildford. That night, the couple slept the sleep of the innocent, blissfully unaware of the nightmare that lay ahead. For the first few weeks of their forced marriage, the teenagers got to know each other. But less than six weeks after the wedding, Jane received startling news. A lady-in-waiting came to her bedchamber with the news that her cousin, the boy, King Edward, was severely ill. She was to go at once to her father-in-law, Lord Northumberland's estate. At Northumberland's palace, the young couple were met by a disturbing scene. As Jane wrote in her diary, Everyone began making complimentary speeches and bending their knee, which made me blush. My distress increased when my parents paid homage to me. Finally, Jane's father-in-law, Lord Northumberland, told her the king was dead. For the first time, a shocked Jane was told that she was to become the Queen of England. I fell to the ground, weeping piteously for the death of the king, and cried out, The crown is not my right, and pleaseth me not. Telling her it was for the good of England, Jane's scheming parents convinced her to assume the throne. Later she wrote, I should not have accepted it. It showed a lack of prudence. 
The next day, Jane was taken to the tower where she was proclaimed queen. The crown was brought to her, but Jane insisted that she had not asked to see it. It was explained that the crown was going to be adjusted to fit her head. Then Jane found out that a king's crown was being fitted for her husband, Guildford. Suddenly, the whole ugly plot became clear. Her scheming father-in-law, Lord Northumberland, was using her to have his son, Guildford, become king. Jane was furious. She told the councillors they had betrayed her. She couldn't trust her parents. She was alone. I told them I will never, never allow Guildford to become king. Meanwhile, outside the tower, Princess Mary was raising an army to take the throne by force. A civil war over the crown erupted. Jane was to remain in the tower until Mary was captured. Although Jane did not know it, the 15-year-old would never set foot outside the fortress walls again. As Jane passed her days and nights quietly in the tower, across England, the entire country began to take sides for either Mary or Jane. The stakes were high and the price of failure was death. Jane was now in the eye of the storm. At the time, powerful noblemen were able to raise their own militia. Northumberland gathered soldiers and set off to try and defeat Mary and her followers. If he failed, he knew he would pay with his life. As the desperate Northumberland battled back in London, his scheme was unravelling and support for Mary was growing. The council began to question their decision, making Jane queen. Jane had become a liability. In a desperate attempt to save themselves, the council switched their support to Mary Tudor as their rightful monarch. They declared Northumberland a traitor and Jane a usurper. Jane's time as queen was up. Word was sent to Jane's father that his daughter must give up the crown, which only ten days earlier she had tried so hard to refuse. On hearing the news, Jane said to her father, I much more willingly take it off than I put it on. Please, may we go home now? Her father didn't answer. Northumberland was defeated by Mary's army and taken prisoner. Jane's parents fled the tower, leaving their daughter behind. Jane was arrested for treason and was left in the tower a prisoner, along with her teenage husband, Guildford. A triumphant Mary Tudor took the throne as Queen of England and began plotting her revenge on everyone who had kept her from power. Jane's father-in-law, Northumberland, paid for his treason with his head. But even bloody Mary could not believe that Jane Grey was a traitor. The teenager had simply been a pawn in a massive game of power politics. Jane knew that she had to stand trial for treason. But Jane had been given the Queen's word that she and her husband would be pardoned. Jane's thoughts were with her husband. If it be your will, Lord, let me be pardoned. But above all, let my husband be spared. Everything might have gone according to plan if Jane's father had not foolishly raised an army to return his daughter to the throne. Jane's father and his army seized the south bank of the River Thames. He demanded the tower and his daughter and that the new Queen Mary should surrender to him. When Queen Mary refused, he actually bombarded the tower with his own daughter inside. He was endangering his daughter's life as well as that of the Queen. 
Jane's fate, though, was sealed. The innocent teenager now had to die to end the plots against the new queen. Jane's fate was sealed. She had a chance to see her doomed, beloved husband, Guildford. But unable to face the pain, she refused to meet him. To meet him would weaken our resolve to meet our deaths. We must postpone our meeting until we meet in a better world where our happiness will be eternal. From her cell, the teenager watched her young husband led to the scaffold. She remained at the window until his headless body was carried back. For the first time, she broke down and wept. Now, it was Jane's turn to face the executioner. A pawn in the struggle for the throne, she walked bravely from her cell to the scaffold on Tower Green. As she mounted the steps, Jane remained brave and calm. But her priest and her ladies-in-waiting broke down and wept. When Jane knelt down and tied a handkerchief around her eyes, she reached for the block, but it was beyond her reach, and for the first time she panicked. Everyone on the platform froze in horror. Finally, one of the crowd mounted the steps of the scaffold and placed the hands of the terrified girl on the block. Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. 